Welcome to Hope Church. We're recording this ahead of time in the chapel so that it's going to be available for everyone to watch on Sunday morning. And we're very grateful to one of our own members, Simon Heinsen, who's going to be leading uh, the rest of the service today, and I'm going to hand over to him in a few minutes. Uh, but first, just want to remind you of a few things. Uh, remember the Christmas book. Hopefully you've um, received this in the post. Uh, if you haven't received a copy yet, do get in touch and we'll make sure that gets to you. Uh, what we want you to do is to read that this month and then to think who you could give that to uh, in December. So, read Who Stole Christmas. And then a reminder that uh, we, we have this opportunity still to, to, to keep in touch through using Zoom during this time of lockdown. And we're going to have uh, our meeting again at 12 o'clock this morning by Zoom where we can share together. And we can also pray together. We're going to have our prayer meeting at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. And I would encourage you, please do, even if you can't get to the prayer meeting, please do use the prayer news. We invest a lot of effort in uh, producing that each week so that we can all know what's going on and pray for one another and pray for God's work in the world. And that very much takes us to our theme this morning and where I want to begin this morning. Um, during this second time of, of lockdown, we've begun each service with uh, something from Paul's letter to the Philippians, which, remember, was written by Paul uh, in, 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 if you like, real lockdown. He was in prison writing to the church in Philippi. So what was he doing in lockdown? Well, let's read what he says here as he opens the letter. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, what was he doing in lockdown? He was praying. And isn't that amazing that however tight a lockdown we might be put in, we can still pray. It's the one thing we can do in all circumstances, in every situation. So if we don't pray, it's, it's not the government that's stopping us. In the end, it's ourselves. It's because we don't want to or we don't feel like it. So what gets Paul praying in this situation? Well, we see here his love for the Philippians, his love for God's people. He sees them as partners in his work. They're co-workers. The whole letter oozes with this sort of love for them. And the other thing is his joyfulness. He, the joyfulness that he speaks of here, that again is just so communicated through what he writes. Where does that come from? It comes from a confidence in God's purpose. He is absolutely certain that God will complete his good work, as he calls it. I'm someone that struggles to complete anything. Well, God always completes his work. And that's a wonderful encouragement for prayer. But then look at what Paul actually prays for. Because not only does he say, I'm praying for you, he actually tells the Philippians what he's praying for a few verses later. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I wonder, do your prayers ever sound like that? Do you ever pray that for yourself? Or for someone else. Let's just look at one of those requests very briefly. He says that uh, it's this prayer that you may be, be able to discern what is best. That's a slightly odd request, isn't it? Because surely we do that anyway. I mean, no one goes around uh, thinking, yeah, I'm going to choose what's going to be bad for me. I'm going to choose what's going to harm me. No one ever does that, so we presumably always think we are choosing what is best. The problem is, we're rubbish at it. 
And actually, very often, we, we choose what is bad for us. We choose what does harm us. That's what happens every time we sin. We are choosing what harms us. So actually, we need to understand that we are terrible at knowing what is best for us, which is why we need to pray for this. We are praying for God's wisdom, for, uh, for, for his perspective to, to change how we are able to then discern what is best. It's something actually to pray for the government as well. Just think about this whole virus crisis. What, what has been so difficult? It has been incredibly difficult to know what is best, isn't it? To know how, how best to try and tackle this problem. Well, this is in a way, it's not quite what Paul has in mind, but this is something actually we could pray for the government. But it certainly is something we need to pray for ourselves and for each other. To have God's wisdom, to know what is best, how to please him at this time and in these circumstances. So with that, let's actually turn to God in prayer. Let's pray together now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can pray. We thank you that we come to a loving Heavenly Father because of the saving work of Jesus, your Son, and the gift of the Holy Spirit who enables us to cry out to you. We thank you, you have made all of that possible, that we can come to you in prayer. And we thank you that this is not some sort of futile exercise. It is not just some routine or it's not something to make ourselves feel better. We are coming to the God who accomplishes his purpose through the prayers of his people. And we pray that that would uh, encourage us to come to you in prayer, to come to you joyfully with boldness. We pray, Heavenly Father, keep us from the sin of unbelief, where we become discouraged, where we become bitter, we become cynical. We start to think, what's the point? Keep us from such thinking and, and put, put before us afresh what it means to trust in you, to see all that your Son has accomplished, that this would encourage us to pray together. And help us, Lord, as we, as we pray this very prayer that we've looked at already this morning. We pray that our love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that we may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. May we know your wisdom, we pray. May we grow as Christians. We ask, Lord, that we would be able to look back at this time in years to come and recognize that actually for all of its difficulties, this was a time that we learned to trust you better, to obey you more, to be more faithful to you, and indeed to bear a better witness to our Savior. So, Father, help us at this time. Help us to grow. And teach us afresh from your word this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as well as uh, preaching, Simon has also prepared another children's talk. Uh, you remember last week, uh, we were looking at the Israelites grumbling in the wilderness. Well, this week, they're still grumbling. We're actually looking at an event uh, that's, that's at the beginning of their time in the wilderness, and we're going to uh, watch that presentation now. Do you remember? Do you remember what you had for breakfast? Do you remember what you did last Tuesday? Or have you forgotten? Sometimes I walk up the stairs and forget what I came up for. Last week we heard a story about the Israelites when they were in the desert after they came out of Egypt. Do you remember? It was about a bronze snake. And this week we're going to hear another story about the Israelites from the time they were in the desert. But first I want to introduce you to something that God said about the Israelites. They had seen my work. Try to remember back to junior church. The Israelites had been slaves in Egypt. They'd seen God's awesome power in the ten plagues 
that he brought against Egypt. They'd been there on the night of the Passover when all the firstborn in Egypt died. They'd miraculously passed through the Red Sea on dry ground. And when the Egyptian armies had tried to chase them in their chariots, they'd seen them all drown in the Red Sea. They had seen my work. They'd seen the lightning and heard the thunder and the deafening trumpet blast when Moses had gone up the mountain. And where was he now? He'd gone up the mountain. He'd been gone for 40 days and 40 nights. Where was he? When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. What short memories the people of Israel had. Hadn't they seen everything that God had done for them to rescue them? Couldn't they be patient and wait for Moses to come back? Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two stone tablets of the testimony, that's the Ten Commandments, in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. Tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. You see, God was angry and Moses was angry too. He was so angry that he threw the Ten Commandments that God himself had written and smashed them to pieces. It was like a picture of the law that the Israelites had broken. And that wasn't the end of the story. Moses took the calf they had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. Yuck, that must have tasted horrible. And even worse was to follow, but we haven't got time to go into that now. So why did all this happen? Did they forget? What does God say? You see, we shouldn't try to guess the answer to our questions. We should always listen to what God says. What does he say? They are a people who go astray in their heart. And he also says, See to it that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. You see, the problem with the Israelites was not just a short memory, but an unbelieving heart. They are a people who go astray in their heart. That was their problem, and it's also ours. We're just the same, we go astray in our hearts. Praise God that the good news of the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is that God says, I will give you a new heart. Well, there's always something to learn from God's Word. And uh, if you want to follow up that story, you'll find that in uh, Exodus chapter 32. But some of the other verses I also made reference to, you'll, you'll find, if you want to dig a bit deeper, in Psalm 95, 
and also in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. So there's some homework for those, uh, those of you who are Bible scholars, and I hope that's all of us. Now Stephen has uh, been talking to us about uh, prayer, and uh, that is going to be the, the subject of our, of our uh, uh, consideration this morning. But what is the ground on which we can approach God in prayer? And that's really what I want to focus on in the first hymn that we're going to read through. Um, it's one of my favourite hymns. Uh, it's, a, it's not a modern one, but it's, it's a, a great hymn. Um, and we're going to consider the words now. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is written on his hands, my name is hidden in his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no power can force me to depart. No power can force me to depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, I look to heaven and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen lamb. My perfect spotless righteousness the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace, one with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is safe with Christ on high, with Christ my saviour and my God, with Christ my saviour and my God. <clears throat> and as we come very briefly to pray, it's because Christ is our Saviour and our God and that we can approach him because our lives, if we're believers, are safe with Christ on high. Let's come to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we do indeed give you thanks this, this morning that we can approach you that we can bring to you our worship, our, our thanksgiving, our adoration. We thank you for the gift of prayer that we can communicate with you, the one true and living God. And we do pray, Lord, that as we give ourselves this morning in worship and in reading your word, in seeking your face, we pray that you would be pleased to meet with us. And Lord, we know that uh, the circumstances in, in which we find ourselves at, at the moment are, are so very different to anything we've ever known before. And most of the people listening to this, uh, this service are not in this room at this time, but we thank you that you transcend all these circumstances. We thank you that you can speak to us through your word. And we pray that you would do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the Bible reading that we're going to look at is found in Luke chapter 11. And we are going to read the first 13 verses. And the whole theme of this passage is Jesus' teaching about prayer. So it's Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, 
Teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we also forgive everyone who, who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend. And he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set, to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen. And may God help us to understand his word and to learn from the Lord Jesus Christ how to pray. So we're going to look at that subject this morning. <clears throat> Jesus teaches us how to pray. So what I am hoping to do uh, this morning is just to bring out some thoughts from the, the passage that we've read. And it's, it's impossible, really, to go into any great depth uh, with, um, for instance, the Lord's Prayer here. Um, that would potentially take several, several sessions. But just some general observations and general thoughts that I hope will, will help us to um, begin to... Uh, dig into this passage. So, my first thought, and the, the, whole, the whole purpose of this morning, is to not only to help us to understand what prayer is, but also to encourage us to pray. So, the first thought is this. We need to pray. First four verses, which cover here, the, the Lord's Prayer. Jesus says in verse 2, when you pray, it's an assumption that the Lord is making. If you were to read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, he has the same formula, the same um, wording. He says, when you give to the needy, when you pray, when you fast. These things are assumed for the disciples, that prayer in particular here is, um, is part of the essential life of the Christian. In fact, we read here that Jesus himself was praying. Now, the Son of God who uh, knew a perfect um, relationship of fellowship with his father, he himself, in his earthly life, prayed. He, he took time out. He took time aside um, to find a quiet place to pray to his father in heaven. 
And if Jesus needs to pray, then surely so do we. Secondly, the second point here, though, is that you can learn to pray. The disciples, one of the disciples, and probably uh, we don't know which one, of course, but he was probably speaking on behalf of all of them because they would have seen the Lord praying. Um, <coughs> it come, he comes up to the Lord, speaking on behalf of them all, and, and says, Lord, teach us to pray. And again, it, it's not just in this little band of disciples as well. He says, uh, um, just as John taught his disciples. This is something that can be taught. And perhaps we need to take that on board. That um, in our church life, we should, we should uh, include it as part of discipling uh, one another. That we teach one another to pray. You can learn to pray. But of course here, Jesus himself is the teacher. And it's the Lord that we go to, that we ask that he will teach us to pray. Who can learn to pray, though? Can anyone learn to pray? Who is he talking to? He's talking to disciples here. He's talking to people who call Jesus Lord, who are able to address the Father, our Father. And there is a, a common sort of misunderstanding, really, that, uh, that, that anyone can uh, simply say the Lord's Prayer, our Father, and that will be in some way uh, counted as praying. Now, all of us are, um, God is our, our Father, God is the Father of everyone on the, on the planet, in the, in the sense that he is their creator. But it, for the disciple, for the believer, for the Christian, um, the Christian has been adopted into the family of God, and God is his Father in a very special sense. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, if, if you like, our, our elder brother, who teaches us to pray by his grace and by the help of his spirit and his people and the word of God. So we can learn to pray, but as God himself, our, our heavenly father, helps us. Just... I would just mention here that this is a pattern for prayer, not a parroted prayer. Um, so many church services will include the Lord's Prayer as part of their service, but it's almost rattled off or parroted without really any, any understanding. And it's so ironic, really, that um, in Matthew's Gospel, um, this teaching about prayer is... Um, immediately preceded by Jesus saying, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. We can't approach the Lord's Prayer as a, a, a magic formula or something that, that can simply be said. It is a pattern for the way in which we should pray, but it is, is not meant in, in the way it was given here to be something that's just rattled off as a religious ritual or formula. Now moving on to the parts of the prayer here. Um, God comes first. Now Donald Trump, of course, is well known for his little motto, America first. Well in the Lord's Prayer, we have this motto, God comes first. Um, all the, the early clauses of the Lord's Prayer, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, and in the older versions, your will be done. God's name, God's kingdom, God's will. 
are all at the heart, all at the center um, and up front in this prayer. And um, the Lord is teaching us to hallow these things, to, to, to make sure these things are, are, are honored. Now, we just had a children's talk um, uh, where the, the Israelites were bowing down to a golden calf. And in so doing, they broke the first three commandments at least, uh, that uh, they should only have one God, uh, that they should not make idols, and they should honor, or, uh, honor the name of the Lord, your God. Hallowed be your name. Honored. Counted as something holy and, and worthy. The Lord's name and the Lord's causes his kingdom, his will, should be first in our praying. And sometimes, you know, uh, when you're in a prayer meeting and somebody says, well, who's got something to share? Who would like to, uh, um, uh, what, what, what should we pray for? And perhaps if there's nothing else that occurs to our minds, we should pray that the Lord would be honoured by the Lord's name would be honoured by the way we live. The Lord's name would be honoured by, the, by our, um, our walk as we, as we um, live amongst people who are not believers. That God's name should be honoured. And then we need to pray. We need to pray about material things, about our daily bread, our needs, the things that the Lord can supply for us so that we can um, survive and get through with all the practical needs that we have. Um, we need to pray for our sins, our that we might be forgiven daily for our sins. We need to come to him. We need to keep a short account with God and uh, uh, that we are uh, coming to him regularly. And there's dangers, there's dangers. And uh, the Lord says here, lead us not into temptation. And again, in the older ver version, uh, deliver us from evil. We need to pray. We need God's help. We are weak. We are frail and we are susceptible to temptation. Um, without the Lord's help, we will fall. So we need to pray. And that uh, is, is the last clause here in the Lord's Prayer. But if that's the case, we need to pray. The Lord teaches us a bit more as well. He says here, we need to persist in prayer. Um, we have this, first of all, a, a parable. Now, sometimes it's called a parable of the friend at midnight. Um, or you might want to call it the parable of the sleepy man. Um, and uh, um, it's this story of the, of the friend who comes late at night, asking for three loaves of bread. And he's turned away because the man is tucked up in bed. He's perhaps a bit selfish. Uh, he's he's um, got himself nice and comfortable and warm. Um, it's, it, it's a bit of a trouble to him to actually have to come downstairs and unlock the doors and find the bread and, and send his friend on his way. Um, perhaps he's a bit lazy don't know. But the friend persists. He keeps knocking on the door. And these are the comments that J.C. Ryle says uh, about this parable. As selfish and slothful as we naturally are, we are capable of being roused to exertion by continual asking. The man who would not give three loaves at midnight for friendship's sake at length gave them to save himself the trouble 
of being further entreated. Now, Jesus is not saying that um, God is a reluctant giver. Far from it. The whole point of what he's saying is, is keep going, keep persisting, keep asking. And... Sorry. The... Um, the promise that follows this parable emphasizes that. He says in verse, uh, verse 9, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who receives, he who seek, everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Just think about this promise for a moment. Who makes this promise? Beginning of verse 9, I say to you, Jesus makes this promise. Who does he promise? He, he says, everyone who asks, everyone who seeks, everyone who knocks will receive the answer that they, that they, that they seek that they want. And it's a strange sort of inverted pride, really, to somehow think that you are uh, an, ex an exception to this everyone. What makes you think that you're the only person in the world that, that Jesus won't keep this promise for? We should trust, we should believe that Jesus will keep his word. Everyone who asks, receives. So we need to persist. We need to keep going. And um, I'm just going to break off for a moment or two and share one or two things. We, we've been praying for our friends in Bordeaux, the church that has uh, started maybe a couple of years ago now, um, uh, Pastor Maxime, and, uh, Maxime, Demel, Maxime Sumandnes and his wife Demelza. Um, and they've, they've been sending us their prayer letter and we've been praying about several things here for that church in Bordeaux in France. And um, we heard in the summer that Maxime had been unwell. And so we've been praying about that. We have a, um, a November newsletter here. Maxime is feeling a bit better and he's been greatly helped. And um, that's one of the things we prayed. Um, we prayed at the, right at the beginning of the year about... Um, their meeting place. They, they rent a cafe in Bordeaux and they've been given notice that they would no longer be able to do that. Um, but no other meeting place um, presented itself and they didn't know where they were going to continue meeting. And it seemed like God wasn't answering their prayers. Um, their their um, lease was up uh, early in the year. And then, of course, the pandemic arrived. And they couldn't meet anywhere, and no, neither could anyone else. And it seems that God had been working out his, his um, plans um, for them, that they wouldn't need anywhere to meet. And now they're back in the same cafe in September. Um, we were feeling hopelessly weak and wondered whether, whether to continue, they write. And we prayed for God's clear guidance and help. That week we had four visitors. And the following week we were joined by a further three visitors. Each one is an answer to prayer. Very specific prayers we have asked you to pray answered prayer when it's shared in this way. 
is such an encouragement. The Lord will answer our prayers if we keep on persisting in our prayers. So we need to pray, we need to persist in prayer, and we need to believe in prayer. These final verses. First of all, there's a short mini second parable. Jesus asks this question, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? And it's a sort of rhetorical question, really, because no uh, decent um, parent, no father with good parenting skills will give um, these, these harmful things, either a, a, a snake or a scorpion, um, to their child. It's a sort of parable based on good parenting skills, if you like. So when Jesus asks the question, and then there's an application of the parable, he says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to good gi good give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So first of all, he says, how much more? How much more? There's a contrast between the... Um, the parent who is doing his best. Um, and we all, as parents, I'm sure, want to do our best for our children. But we sometimes get it wrong. We sometimes do say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. Um, if you, though, know what's good, what is something that your child will love and appreciate, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts? Now, there's a sort of logic, gospel, I'm going to call it gospel logic, in the, in the way that um, Jesus presents these, these, these thoughts. Think... Uh, it's not the only place that he, that he uses it as well. Think of um, the Sermon on the Mount, again, about the birds of the air and, the, um, and how they are fed. So how much more will you be cared for? Um, the lilies of the valley, they're clothed in splendor. How much more will the Lord um, look after your practical, material needs. And it applies to spiritual things as well. When we are uh, feeling weak, when we are feeling as though we can't press on in the Christian faith, as though we lack resources, um, Paul reasons with his hearers. And, and he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? You see, God, it, it's a sort of logical thing. It's, it's um, Christ and Paul here. It's using, using reason to prove how God will care, how God will sustain his people. Um, if God hasn't spared his own son, the... Uh, the cross, where he has paid our debt, he has dealt with our sins, they have been uh, dealt with forever, we have passed from death to life through faith in him, how will he not, having done that, graciously give us everything else that we need for our spiritual walk with him? We will press on 
God will give us the reserves that we need. He will help us through to the end. Gospel logic. Use it. Reason with yourself. God has given me so much. He won't let me down. And Jesus says, how much more does your heavenly father, is, is he capable of um, knowing what is good for us? Uh, he is our father. He is the one who cares for us. He, he, he has adopted us as his own. We are his children. And not only is he a father, but he is a father in heaven. He is the almighty, he is the omnipotent God. Now, sometimes we intend good for our children or for our friends or for one another. But we let people down. We don't, in the end, have the power or the ability to do what we've promised. But God is not like that. He is the Father in heaven who is um, all-powerful, almighty. His purposes will all be fulfilled. He will see to it. He will keep us and sustain us. How? How much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You see, at the end of the day, what we ultimately need, what we ultimately are encouraged here to pray for, is that we will know God himself. He will give us the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in our lives. We need the Spirit. We need him. Um, he is the one who has brought us to faith. He is the one who enables us to grow in grace and grow in faith and understanding. Just read the prayers that are in the New Testament, in Paul's letters, that God would grant understanding, that he would, he would give the believers there spiritual strength and spiritual um, power to understand what God has given them. He gives, the Spirit gives inner strength. He sustains our soul. He helps us daily. He is, in fact, the guarantee of our perseverance, the guarantee of heaven itself. The Holy Spirit of God is God himself with us, living with us, dwelling with us. We need to pray. We need to persist in prayer. We need to believe in prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. Amen. We're going to read uh, a, a hymn here. Um, it's quite a long hymn, but bear with it. I'm going to read the, uh, the verses. Um, on this whole theme again of prayer. Lord, teach us how to pray aright with reverence and with fear. Though dust and ashes in your sight we may, we must draw near. We perish if we cease from prayer. Oh, grant us power to pray. And when to meet you we prepare, Lord, meet us on our way. Burdened with guilt, convinced of sin, Weak when we face the foe, fightings without and fears within. To whom, Lord, shall we go? O God of love, before your face we come with contrite heart to ask from you these gifts of grace, truth in the inward part. Give deep humility, the sense of godly sorrow give, a strong desiring confidence to hear your voice and live Faith 
in the only sacrifice that can for sin atone, to set our hopes, to fix our eyes on Christ and Christ alone. Patience to watch and weep and wait, whatever you may send, courage that will not hesitate to trust you in the end, to the end. Give these and then your will be done, thus strengthened with all might. We, through your Spirit and your Son, shall pray and pray aright. And God grant that he will teach us to pray and help us to pray um, and that he would grant all our requests in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have spoken to us. We thank you, Lord, that um, you teach us to pray. And we ask, gracious God, that you might more and more make us a praying people. That all these things that we've considered this morning might be something that, that becomes a part of who we are as Christians, as individuals, but also as a church. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you might go with us into this coming week. We need your strength, we are weak. We need discernment, for we are so often blinded by our own uh, lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding. We pray, Lord, help us in all these things. Help us to represent you and to honour your name before men this week. And we pray these things for your sake. Amen.